So one of the things we learn about innovation, and thank you for being here, is you have to pivot. Right? You have to be able to turn, to move quickly. And I want to thank Ilana in advance because we are having a little computer communications issue. So for those who remember the old days when there were slides and you would say, beep, and you would forward the slide, um, Ilana will move the slides ahead and we'll go forward. But it's, um, it's really wonderful to be here. There's an article called the Headwinds, tailwinds, asymmetry. For those who know about behavioral economics, um, a lot of it started here, by the way, with uh, Avram Forsky and uh, Danielle Kanahan. So a paper written by Shai Davidovich and Tom Gilovich called The Headwinds, Tailwinds, Asymmetry. How many of you bicycle, run, I feel also somebody held a gun to Some of us walk. Probably <laughs> <not>. <laughs> it's, it's even more noticeable when you're flying. So, so assuming that one word um, to, to run or bike, the idea behind the article very quickly is that when you are facing the winds and it's much harder to pedal or to run, you're longing for that moment when You'll make the turn, and you'll feel actually the tailwinds that will be helping to move you forward. And this article goes on to say that in the moment of difficulty when we're facing the headwinds and we're struggling, and we're waiting for that moment of improvement, once we get to that side where the situation improves, we suddenly forget how bad it was a few moments ago, and we begin complaining about now even though we're in the tailwinds, now we have a new set of problems, which is, could be a meta-commentary on Safer Bami Bar, maybe the Jewish people. <laughs> it's kind of hard to know. Um, so I want to just take one moment of hakarat tato to think about all the tailwinds um, that are here that help me to get to be where I am. Rabbi Ron Hochberg, my youth director when I was a teenager. The USY is sitting in this room today. <laughs> Rabbi Dr. David Galinkin, my Mishnah teacher in Rishonin, back in the early 1980s. Um, Ilana, we, we won't even go into like all those those connections and so many more. And also Avi, you know, six, eight months ago we met. Um, but I knew after 10 minutes when he said, so what are you going to teach? You know, there was like a connection right away, and with many others too. So I want to just acknowledge my teachers and inspirations in my own life, um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and we'll make it worth your while because you're going to have to work a little bit, and I'm only going to present for a part of the time. So. This last book that came out, and Avi, thank you for promoting it. If everybody buys a copy, and I was able to get, even though the expiration uh, date, don't worry about it, I got permission from my publisher um, to extend 40% discount. If enough people buy it, I can retire by the age of 777, <laughs> based on the royalties. 770. Yes. So... And then you become the Mashiach. If you're looking for a, a book to use with your congregational or organizational board, the book is about leadership. It's not, I mean, synagogue is the case study, but it's a book about how to lead in the 21st century, which involves innovation and entrepreneurship, which are different. But um, this last book, which came out in November, I co authored. And why don't we um, move to the next slide, please? I wanted it to be a combination of theory, story, what's really happened, not from up here, but on the grassroots in congregations. And these are congregations and nonprofit organizations in the United States. But um, it's got to also have some pathos to it, something that you can take and apply. And if we could advance one more slide. Um, my co-author, two, 
two suggestions. One, always have a co-author um, because you can learn so much more in partnership and have one that's much better looking than you are. That, that always helps. Um, she is a professor at a Lutheran seminary. At one point, we found so much in common, we wanted to call ourselves the Jutherans. Why is that? Lutherans have Bible camps. They have established congregations that are declining in membership. They have an ecology of startup organizations and nonprofits. And they're very much in the same situation in terms of organization. And for me, they're not um, Professor, Dr. Rabbi David Lincoln's here where I thought, I'll never be a great communist. I, I still love to learn. But I care about organizations and got a PhD in organizational development because we're not a business, but we, there are things that we can learn from the business world that can help us increase our impact, change Jewish lives, and change Jewish communities. We can take things from the business world and adapt them to the world of Jewish community. What happens very often and when things go wrong is when consultants from the outside bring in tools and processes that work wonderfully for a for-profit company, but they don't always work so well in the context of community. So my co-author, and please move to the next slide, Terry Elton and I, wanted to take a look at two different kinds of congregations. And by the way, what you're looking at now is actually our agenda. Um, what's the difference between innovation and entrepreneurship and why does it matter? You're going to do a self-assessment of your innovation quotient, right? Part of the ability to be here today is to turn off your cell phone if you can, um, to really try to focus and forget about the rest of the world out there for a moment. So you'll do a little private reflective work and then think about, I'll suggest four different pathways to, toward innovation, three of which any congregation, nonprofit can follow. It has to fit your culture. Any congregation or community can be an innovator. Not every congregation or nonprofit is entrepreneurial, and I'm not sure that they should be. That's really, to me, it's an open question. But I hope that you'll be able to take away some practical information that you'll be able to apply, and we'll do group learning and then share. So that's kind of the program. Um, if you don't understand me, it's too bad because I'm going to keep on going. No. If you don't understand me, if it's a question that relates to a slide, please interrupt and ask. If not, and it can wait until we get a little further in, then we'll do that too. But what's most important is not that we get through all the material, but that you walk away with something that you can use. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. So there's kind of this storyline that all of the old institutions, congregations, nonprofits, the legacy institutions are dying and the startups are thriving and flourishing. And this is both in the Lutheran and the Jewish, it's the 21st century religious communities actually. And we, we thought, okay, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. We went out to go uh, in a small sample and see, is that really happening? So we looked in both communities at established congregations and nonprofits that were at least 25 years old, some were 150 years old, that were trying to decentralize, to uh, be more co-creative, to be more inclusive. But then we looked at the startups that were not brand new, that were at least five years old, which is a stage of early organizational maturity. And that's the point at which an organization has to begin to scale up in order to be sustainable or risk really losing itself. 
And when they hit that point of five years, so these startups, then they struggle with how do we keep the DNA that got us started and at the same time become sustainable but not be like the place that we promised we would never become. So we wanted to take a look at both sides of the equation and understand was there shared learning, each from the other, across congregations, nonprofits, and faith communities. Brian? Yes. This seems the five year thing really struck me. It's true with the midst of heroes starting their projects. And at the five year point, the people, the founders, the visionaries, are the fundraisers for having to set up an organization. And I'm trying to keep up. I'm, I'm waiting to see what your next slide is to see whether it works for the, the midst of people. Um, I'll be curious to hear because you have, I know, quite a bit of experience that I'm not going to. I guess we go both go back long enough to say yes. You have a lot of experience, so let's let's ask that. And if you could keep going on a little bit further, uh, stay right there if you would. And a 21st century capacity requirement of any organization is innovation. Another one that I deal with in the book is organizational foresight. How do you try to see further ahead into the future so that instead of being reactive, you can actually try to shape the future to the extent that one can do that? We're not going to look at that today. But in the 20th century, knowing how to run a board, knowing how to read a budget, those were capacities, those were requirements. Today, another requirement is being innovative. Again, the question is how to do that in a way that's authentic to your mission, and mission becomes even more important today. So what is the difference between um, innovation and entrepreneurship? There is definitely an overlap, and that's why I like the Venn diagram. An organization or a leader who is entrepreneurial will by definition be innovative will always be innovative. Innovators may become much more entrepreneurial and change the culture, or they may remain innovators. A lot of it has to do with culture, by organizational culture. Um, meaning that the person who is more entrepreneurial is always looking for the opportunity and building a team. You see, ideas change as they develop. And when you look in the business world, um, usually funders invest, you know, they want a solid idea, proof of concept, a minimum viable product, but they want to see your team. Because they know that if you're really good, your idea is going to change. And do you have the team with you that can help move the idea along as you begin to put it into the field and to test it. Innovation, if we'll go to the next slide for a moment. Innovation is um, different in a way. Innovation is an act or a series of actions. Innovators might think of a new program, a new process, um, a new way of doing an old program. Innovation can happen over a short period of time or over a long cycle of time. I think it's unfair, you know, it makes for headlines, I guess, to say that the Jewish community never innovates. That's really not true. I think, you know, that's a little harsh. If you take a look at a congregational bulletin from paper copy, I guess, 1995, and then a bulletin from 2005, and then a bulletin from 2015, of course congregations innovate, nonprofits innovate. They innovate too slowly, by the way. Um, but they do innovate. But innovation is much more about an act or series of actions that um, can exist within hierarchies and will always exist within entrepreneurial um, organizations. 
Okay, let's move on to the next slide and we'll go a little, uh, yes? Um, I'm still not, I guess, really clear on how you're differentiating between innovation and so, entrepreneurship. Um, be a little bit more specific about the, the question and then maybe I can uh, be a little Well, innovation more. is also doing innovative acts and what makes entrepreneurship is you're also doing innovative stuff. Is it just about you, the, the entrepreneur is always the head of the entrepreneurial organization versus the innovator can be somewhere else in the hierarchy? Uh, no, there are four, I'm going to lay out four different pathways to innovation. The last one is much more entrepreneurial, so if you could hold your question, but maybe I can give you a little bit more clarity, but we're, we're actually going to go into that in just a moment. So. And in, you might be an innovator who's innovating yesterday's best practices. That is not going to get you very far as an organization. Someone who is entrepreneurial is going to throw out the playbook from yesterday. In fact, they're not going to necessarily start with a playbook. Or they're going to start with a sketch or a canvas of an idea. And they will iterate and reiterate and they will, they will much rather go with 80% of a product, of an idea, um, and implement and learn by doing than wait for the committee meeting that will take another year and a half to figure out the 100% that you can't get anyway unless you know by doing. So it's pace, it's culture, it's the ability to spot an opportunity that others can't see and then um, following a set of principles that require a tremendous amount of discipline. Entrepreneurship is not winging it. It's, it's much harder than that. Uh, how many of you like jazz? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Can I get that point of how can you be innovator innovating something from the past? You can't. You're you're copying, so you're not innovating. Well, I, I'm not sure that that's true. So, for example, if in a, a congregation or a community, right, if in your particular congregation you've never done something before that somebody else has, even though they did it 10 years ago, that's an innovation. I wouldn't call that a very innovative place. They're a little late, but that's an innovation. So I'm not yes. My my problem is how you deal being an entrepreneur or innovator when you when you have to deal with what I would call the paradigm of the community, the congregation, the institution. When change is really something that is I would say it creates creates some discomfort some kind of opposition. Uh, in your example, uh, when, I, when I went to my shoes, they were using the silver from 1946. We even had even the prayer for the state of Israel with an English, and I am not American, you can tell by my accent, but with, a, with, a, with, a, with an English that they did. They did it. So, so, they so he that. innovated and bought the new silver in those times. So when I when I when I finally when I finally got uh, another silo, right? Uh, <coughs> that was a very better English and then oh but this prayer is not the same like in our now. We we cannot have it. Because all our life we did it. So the paradigm of the institutions. So we're going to talk about a couple of practical strategies about how you navigate that challenge. Because on the one hand, you don't want to disenfranchise people who like it the way it is. It happens to be very often a dwindling number of people who like it the way it is. So I, you know, as I learned from my rabbi, uh, Cass Abelson, who's my mentor, he's a uh, should be Agne uh, Abiyah stream. I just had lunch with him, Ilan, as a matter of fact, about three weeks ago, and maybe 
critique something I have been working on for my next book. So, you know, we should all live and be that well. He's an amazing human being. Um, so, I think that we will deal with that issue because it's a very important one. What I learned from him you know, early on, even though I hated the 8.15 p.m. service, I really did when I was <laughs> in the congregation. When I speak with you, by the way, I speak from experience. This is hard work. I've been in a congregation, a federation. My last three bosses were Edgar Brockman, Alava Shalom, Lynn Schusterman, and Michael Steinhardt. Do you think you have? <laughs> we're, we're, faced, we're, we're live, right? Um, they are brilliant and have done amazing things. And they really stretch you and push you. So I, I'm, I'm not speaking, I want to be empathetic and real because I've been there before. But there are ways to do that that we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, OK. I, but I'll give you a few quick answers. Number one. Try going into neutral territory. Right? Don't take something away from the people who like it. Find an area that is waiting to be, you know, that you're interested in. That's empty space. Call something a pilot or a beta. It actually makes people feel a little bit less anxious and you're less at risk. If it works, you're a hero. And if it doesn't work, it's okay because we didn't promise it would go on forever. So those are two strategies. And of course, the other thing that we as rabbis, and it took me a long time to, to, to learn not to do this, is ask for help. The best assets that you have are the people in your communities. And they are vastly underutilized. Most people are willing to help it, it, don't make them volunteers with a lifetime sentence. But if you give them a project that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, in an area of their expertise where they feel that they can make a contribution, then you also have some teammates to work with. Okay? So another way of understanding the difference um, to me, it really relates to, to, to jazz a little bit, or this picture that I really like, and then I want to move on, because you know, I'm talking too much, and you need to work a little bit more. Um, jazz musicians who have never played together, when you put them together, can sound absolutely amazing, because they practice relentlessly, six, eight hours a day. They know when to solo, and they know when to step back. Right? They have kind of a framework. Sometimes you're just given a few chords, and that's it's like, go play, guys. Go play, men and women. And that's what being entrepreneurial is like. It means you have to be highly disciplined and deeply skilled at what you do. And at the same time, it's not that there's no structure. It's just light. And it's within there that you do that kind of work. And that's hard to do in a congregation and a nonprofit, by the way. Let's move on to the next one. In our research, we found three innovative pathways, and one again that is truly entrepreneurial that I put in innovation just because for those who want to try and um, you know, maybe you're in your last contract and you want to try that, you can move in that direction. Reiterating the role, cracking the code, fusing the model, and breaking the mode. These have applied to Lutheran and to Jewish, it turns out, to nonprofit, and also um, to congregations as well. So, next slide, please. Let's take a look at reiterating the role. Re reiterating the role, you might think of as innovation by addition. In other words, if we take the realm of tefillah, so one of our colleagues, Rabbi Bruce Stalin in Denver, Hebrew Education Alliance, went on a sabbatical, he did the tour of all the hot congregations, 
but he knew that Denver, where he lived, wasn't LA and it wasn't New York. But he wanted to come up with his own kind of tefillah that would be suitable to his congregation. And it was innovative. And it, this is a very good example. Other congregations had already been doing you know, a different kind of tefillah. So the main sanctuary tefillah continued, but he brought in a group of lay people. Some of them had Wexner backgrounds. Some of them were musicians. Right? Um, he had a, an open vision of what it would be like. They practiced every week before Shabbat to see, to get a feel for what it would be like. There was still some sort of Magdea Shel Tulak. There weren't one or two changes. There's some tipping point where you add enough change where suddenly you're reiterating the role. There's enough familiar, but also there are enough changes that are different where it suddenly feels like a qualitatively different experience. Or that, that top picture, I don't remember the Sesame Street, you know, like these one of these things doesn't the, belong there or whatever for those who remember. Up here, that's Rabbi Daniel Burke in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. His neighborhood um, had not become gentrified. Right? The neighborhoods around him had. The congregation had a choice. Do we stay or do we leave? They decided to stay. But if they were going to stay, then they had to be a part of the neighborhood. So in a way, now this is my interpretation. This came from a, another book, book um, <coughs> earlier book. What I would say is he reiterated the role of what it meant to be part of a tribe, of being particular. Clearly, they were a Jewish congregation, but instead of just thinking of the tribe of Israel, he was one tribe in the neighborhood of a part of the tribe of humanity. And through the particular, he was able to connect with neighbors and really strengthen a neighborhood. So that was reiterating the role of what it meant to be a particular tribe by broadening the notion. Let's move on to the next one. I know everybody gets tired of hearing about, you know, B'nai Jeshurun, you know, and it's, it's old already, and, and Ikar, all the ones that make the headlines. It's not just the rabbis. It's what it is that they've done in terms of innovation. The, cracking the code I would call innovation by subtraction. Meaning, no organization can do everything well, and congregations are under pressure nonprofits, communities, to do everything. It's not possible. So organizations that thrive in the 21st century are those that know, unless you're a multi-billion dollar entity, if you can do three to five things with excellence in a way that nobody else can, those are the organizations that are thriving. They're focused again on their mission, and we should have more time to spend on mission because it's actually become more important if everybody is an authority um, by definition today um, and everything is open source, then the leadership really has to know their mission well. So cracking the code is more innovation by subtraction, meaning that if we can't do the 25 things that congregations do, but we can do five of them well, and our passion is there, and we draw upon our lay people, can we find partners to collaborate with? Can we outsource some of the work that we do? Can we co-brand or work together so that we can continue to be the leaders in these three to five different things? And by the way, the different areas of focus, even though there aren't many, they're integrated. So I would, I would say that these and a number of emerging congregations have a spiritualized, soulful, social justice rooted in spirituality and serious text study. And everybody is expected to participate in these four or five different aspects 
of, in this case, congregational life. And they all work together to create this sort of um, multiplier effect of energy. Yes? Can you think of one of the most specific examples of the formation of the And I also want to know why you call this cracking the code. Because why don't you yeah. call it innovation by subtraction? <laughs> if that's what it is. I, I, I could. But by I don't know what the code is. So the, the code is, if the code's the Shofan Aruch, I understand why you were cracking it. <laughs> it's a, I see a novel coming. <laughs> so I call it cracking the code because rabbis are expected to do everything. And one of the things that we need to, to get better at is working with a, a core of, of volunteers who will protect us from ourselves, because we often want to say yes, often feel like we have to say yes. And I call it cracking the code because there are, as I said, typically up to five tasks that an organization can do well. And they crack the code of that mysterious you know, 20 or 25 expectations that people have of them, and they say, no, this is who we are, and this is what we're good at, and we're going to help you find another alternative. We're not saying goodbye to you. I mean, are you still being reported? <laughs> so, sometimes it's okay to say goodbye. You know, if you do it nicely. If it's not a fit, it's okay. Right? You want to help people out to find another home that might be more suited to them. But they've cracked the code of that list of 20. They know what they're passionate about. They're really good at it. They practice at it. And that's what gives them this sense of electricity. I don't know how else to describe it. So in the case of the car, for example, I don't remember all four off the top of my head, but you're expected to volunteer um, time for social justice. And I think they found a funder for like for every hour or so, whatever it is that you give. Volunteering, the funder will actually match with dollars, all right, into the social justice fund. Um, you, you commit to a certain number of hours of helping out in the kihila, right? So that you're not like by proxy. Somebody else is doing the work. You do it yourself. Uh, you commit to a certain amount of study and 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 all these things work work together. Yes? Um, well, I'm, when you say it's okay for some people to leave, that's fine when you're in Chicago, Los Angeles, or New York. I live in Minneapolis. So, okay, but have you had examples of congregations or other sort of institutions that have successfully cracked the code that are in places where you say the whole metropolitan area has less than 10,000 Jews? I'm not sure what the threshold is. 10,000, I think you can still crack the code, but you have to then do it a little bit differently. So for example, uh, instead of having two or three parallel sort of activities going on, maybe the innovation is happening, the thing that you're really good at, um, you're just not doing it as frequently. Um, but there is still this tendency not to look at who are the people in the community who maybe had a minor in Jewish studies in college and now they're interested in it again and maybe they want to give back a little bit more. Who are the professors who might teach you know, at the other universities, right? They may be not the experts that you want, but they're the experts that you have. And are you willing to work differently as a, I don't mean you per se, we willing to work differently and not compromise our standards but accept that there's a trade-off that we're making and if we want to go deeper in a few areas it means maybe going with other people who aren't going to do things exactly the way we would like them to be done. And, and I will tell you that sometimes we are part of the problem. Right? Um, not, not that we're controlling. Um, I don't think that that's really the 
the, the, the sole motivation, I think it's because it's, we feel responsibility, right? There's an authenticity, a kind of integrity that we have. And I'm not suggesting that you should sacrifice that, but look more broadly in the community. What can you, what resources can you bring in online, right? With video, very inexpensive today, to help you do some of the other things that people want, but you really feel that in your community, these are the four or five things that are going to make a difference to us now. Yes? Yes, um, that, that's a really good question. So we looked at Mount, uh, Mount Zion Temple in St. Paul. Um, and you could read more about this in the book and then I'm, I'm going to move on. Um, they have gotten really good at, I mean really good, at social justice. They're 125 years old, I think, by the way. Um, and focusing on relationships. So they did one-on-one -on -one house meetings. It was a congregation of 1,100 households. It took them a year or a year and a half, but they understood that if they wanted to move forward, they would have to build tight relationships. With they them. met with every member of the Every family. member. Who did they? So the board, at the time that this happened, and I, I'm sure they were, they were supplemented, were trained in how to do it. Um, it's not quite community organizing, but it was one-on-one -on -one meetings, relationship building, and out of that emerged the mission, and then from the mission came the action. They already had some sort of history, but this is a rabbi, and his quote is in the book, who said, were it not for his mission statement, he would go crazy, because he couldn't do everything. And the thing that really mattered to him and to his volunteers <coughs> was social justice. Every year, during between um, Mincha and Elah, the congregation comes in and they have a discussion about their mission. How are they doing? Have they strayed from their mission? Good, good topic, right? Are they closer? Have they had the impact that they wanted? Um, their mission statement, it, it's like everywhere. And it took a while to get there. It took like five, seven years, really, to, to get it refined. And that's one of the things that they do really well and keep working at. Next slide, please. Fusing the model. This one's a little bit easier. Um, fusing the model, but I should look at my slide because I'm a humanities person. And I picked the word fusion for a purpose. Let's see, pardon me for reading. In nuclear physics, when two lighter atomic nuclei collide at high speeds and become a, a, a heavier nucleus, they produce energy. When that happens, um, fusion in congregations and communities, you get this energy because you might be bringing um, music. Here, well, take a look. Roman Moon, New York, is fusing Eastern spirituality with a Jewish congregational model. Kavanaugh Cooperative in uh, Seattle, another colleague of ours, by the way, by Rachel Nussbaum. Right? A cooperative means people own it together. It's not top down. Everybody has a stake. What happens when you fuse the model of more mass ownership with the congregation? You get something called the Kavanaugh Cooperative. Um, I didn't include the kitchen, which is the Reformed congregation in the San Francisco Bay Area because they hadn't hit the five-year mark. Think about it, though. A kitchen. Right? What's a kitchen? It's a place, well, I'm, this is not my area of expertise. You know, if we were talking about the laundry room, it wouldn't make the name for a, a, a great congregation. But uh, anyway, from what I see... Um, a kitchen is a place where you have recipes from the past, but you can spice them up a little bit. Right? A kitchen suggests intimacy. 
and warmth and community and nurturing. So what happens when you fuse the model of a kitchen with a congregation? Right? These are all examples of fusion, taking two things that don't seem to be directly related, but when you bring them together, you get this kind of energy, which is different from innovation by addition, reiterating the role, you know, the innovation by subtraction, cracking the code, not Shulchan Aruch, but you know, the other kind of code that we talk about, and fusing the model, which means bringing two things that are different together. Quick, sim simple example that I always remember when Rabbi Hochberg was my youth advisor and he would have us over for Shabbat, you know, it was okay to bring a bottle of wine wrapped in aluminum foil. Now, I'm not a very good gift wrapper, but somebody had the brilliant idea of taking a brown paper shopping bag, covering it with gift wrapping paper, and putting tissue paper in it. Now, I can almost look like I'm doing something presentable when I bring a gift to somebody. Right? So, very simple ideas. Look around. What is it that um, is over here and there that maybe if you bring them together, you get something that has new energy, new time to it. And that's another one. Let's take a look at the next slide and then you get to work. And that really is, what does it mean to be entrepreneurial? We did not find many examples of these organizations. And let's use another science metaphor. I was a humanities major at Chanta Ayani Maskir Ayom, so if I don't get this right, you'll excuse me. So DNA is a molecule that carries most of the genetic instructions used in the development, functioning, and reproduction of all known living organisms and many viruses. Okay? The DNA of congregation and Jewish communities is rabbinic Judaism. What's different about these two organizations, and the one on the right is a nonprofit organization, the one on the left is Amichai Lala the Lab Shul, is that their DNA is actually arts. And it's taking arts as the DNA of the community and using it to reinterpret Jewish life. And therefore, because the DNA of those organizations and a couple of others that we found is so different, for that reason, things will constantly be changing. For example, in the world of arts, things like aesthetics, observation, collaboration, performance in the best sense of the word. Um, these are attributes that are necessary and are kind of hardwired into the way people think and work. Lab Shul, some of you may recall, began as kind of a theater troupe, storytelling. And it was from out of that that Amichai really felt that the people were asking for more than just storytelling. Like it was good, but there was something, was there a way, this is an, another example of what it means to pivot. Now, the economy crashing at the time when they were taking off, you know, gave them extra urgency to think about what to do differently. But that's what good and truck do. Right? So he finally felt that that need for something deeper who was able to move into something that, and I love the name by the way, I'm not making any value judgments about what happens, I'm just taking as a researcher. What does Lab Shul convey to you? What does the name tell you? Experiment. And? Experiment. Experiment. Yeah, but what, but what about the Shul? Tradition. Second. <laughs> okay. We're, um, you know, it depends it which, called shul lab, right? It depends which way, you know, if we're reading in Hebrew, it could be shul lab, if, you know, it could be lab shul, but it's this idea of having a DNA of a lab 
right? And maybe in that sense you're you're correct, but something new is always going to come out. If you read it from right to left, it's a loose ball. <laughs> well, there's also an element here of why shul? Why not synagogue or congregation or temple? So the word shul implies something. And again, maybe you could use it.